from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and on today's show, how do you know if an advisor is really on your team? We'll help you with some insights as Joe and OG share their top five red flags that an advisor might not be as good as you'd expect. In our headlines, speaking of advisors, what do advisors think when you want to speculate on a stock? A recent industry publication dives in, and so will we. And I'll share some yummy Italian history trivia. Yummy? Amazing? Yeah, amazing Italian history trivia. And now, two guys who are nearly as good as Bruschetta on a random Wednesday. It's Joe and O J J J J G. I like the word yummy, Joe. I hate to. Well, what's if bruschetta? It's, uh, that's what I was wondering. And well, I, it's, it's if, you know what it is? Oh, I'll tell you exactly what it is. It's the right way to say the word. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Welcome okay, to Budapest. The, <laughs> well, yes. That is the right way to say yeah, that. Sure, sure, sure. Hey, everybody, welcome to Americanization for the win. My <laughs> name's Joe Saul C. I have Joe Bunny on Twitter. We're going to say things however the hell we want. And Doug, if you uh, actually read the script that our own Lacey Langford has written for you, you would know why yummy was in there because it's foreshadowing of what oh, you're going to talk about it. later. I said Yes, it. he has no idea what the hell's coming as usual. But I'll tell you, we're bringing it today, as Doug did mention. He's not even really sure himself what he said, but uh, hey, it's going to be fantastic. Never fantastic am. headline. But you know what? The most fantastic part of the show is Mr. OG is here with us. That is by far yeah. the, uh, sure. the what, 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 what's that line? It's the Surrey with the fringe on top. It's OG. <laughs> Chicks and ducks and geese better scurry. <laughs> I have no idea what you idiots are talking about. <laughs> He Probably something exactly. from this early 70s. <laughs> he knows exactly what we're talking about. How are you, man? Fantastic. Until you we start making fun of ducks. I don't know what that's about. Top. We had a No, we said duck scurry because you're around. Actually, I think we're not making fun of the duck. Duck's ducks, pretty smart. Duck scurry, scurry too, dude. The <laughs> Is that like scurry a, pretty fast. It's a, uh, you're talking about the young chickens, right? That's what uh, you're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Probably. I don't know how we got here. You know what? I think we, you guys need a timeout while I play this. I don't think that timeout was long enough. You guys get back to your corners. Let's play this. There it is. All right. OG's here. Doug's here. We got a top five today. Some of our favorite episodes. So let's go. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from investment news which is an industry rag for financial advisors and uh, this is in a, a piece written by greg greenberg and uh greg talking to a bunch of advisors og and is sharing how different advisors rein in overly bullish clients is that a thing if you've got somebody that wants to go off the deep end i remember it being a overly thing. bullish That'd yeah, be... people people are like, I want to go individual stocks. Let's make. I remember I had this. I had a client uh, one time who was like, Hey, let's do this. Let's put a let's buy a bunch of stocks. Let's put stop losses on them just below. And if they go down, we'll go to cash, and then we'll just regroup the next time we see an indicator that the market goes up. I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, dude. <laughs> like, like what, what are you? Is if we can forward call the market? He goes, No, that's a cool thing. We can't. But if we continually put stop losses under it. When it goes down, we won't lose much money. When it goes up, it's unlimited upside potential. We could just redo it every day. Overly bullish. Overly bullish. Or, <laughs> hey, uh, how about we take half my portfolio and put it in crypto? But uh, Greg says oh, this. Oh, you're using it as a, as a synonym for stupid. <laughs> I <see. laughs> Now it makes sense. Now I'm, now I'm getting it. Not an overly aggressive inmate at the prison. Well, this <laughs> this says Wall Street lore says a shoe shine boy gave Joseph Kennedy a stock tip just prior to the great crash of 1929. And it's so unnerved the future presidential patriarch he immediately cashed out his whole portfolio. It was his realization that rampant speculation got so out of control. Eventually, led to the establishment of the Kennedy family like he saw it coming because he was going the opposite 
way. And his, yeah, because because nothing says I did I don't have any Kennedy money yet as the shoe shine boy, et cetera, et cetera. It's like it's Well like, that's what he's saying. If the shoe shine boy is giving him a tip, it must be it, people the bulls must be running crazy. Yeah. Like it must be crazy talk. So he says, Greg notes that whenever bulls start stampeding, speculators emerge soon after taking retail investors along for the ride or for a ride, depending on whether they escape in time. Mm -hmm. So he talks about going after IPOs, going after collateralized mortgage bonds or meme stocks. And he says they always end in speculative excess. But anyway, he talked to a bunch of different advisors about how they handle it when clients go, Hey, I got this uh, craziness. I want to do Got an idea. Yeah. What do you do? OG? Well, I want to hear what other people say first. Sure. Brandon Dixon James, President Wealth Manager at Resilient Wealth Management, uh, says that most of his clients aren't convinced the current bull market's here to stay, and it's ultimately his job to keep them even keeled when the investment pitch gets fevered. He said, while things seem positive on the, the front of this current bull market, I think the idea is never being too high or too low. My job is to be objective with my clients and always refer back to their goals and their appetite for risk. So at the end of the day, we can't control the ups and downs, certainly can't predict it. So I focus on what we can control. He says he won't purchase individual securities for clients, always outsources that responsibility to third party money managers. If somebody wants to buy individual stocks, have somebody do it for them that actually is using some data to do it. Yeah. I like the idea of, of, kind of be in that neutral, uh, neutral position, right? When the pendulum swings one way too far, the, your advisor should be like, nah, it's not as bad as you think. It's yeah, okay. It, right. It's okay. And then when it swings the other way, like YOLO, AMC, GameStop, you're like, nah, it's not as good as you think. Or if they're like, wow, my portfolio is up a ton. You're like, uh, yes, but yeah, we call them lifeboat drills. We pretend, you know, what happens if the, uh, you know, what happens if the market's down 20% in the next year? What does that, what does that do? You know, what you, you get $800,000 and next year you look and your account's worth 540. What does that mean to you? You know? Yeah. How does that, uh, how does that make you feel? Go back to the individual stock thing. Uh, Brandon says that the reason he outsources it, if they ask him to buy, they don't want to buy it. OG. They want him to go buy individual stocks. He goes, I just think that these third party managers that, I recommend to my clients have the resources and around the clock research teams that can do a much better job on a larger scale than I can because, and this is a paraphrase of what he says, cause it goes on for a few sentences. He said, because his job is to manage the relationships. His job is to build financial plans. His job is not to be Joe stock jock. If you're going to do that at all. And obviously earlier on, he said, don't, but if you're still going to insist on doing it, have somebody that does it full time, that that's, that's what they do. Similarly, Greg Halter, director of research at the Carnegie Investment Council, says if his clients want to have a brokerage account to speculate, that's fine with him. He said, we really don't want to know about it. Some clients do buy individual stocks to speculate, I'm sure. I would imagine it would be the companies that are so-called penny stocks. But again, that's something we don't encourage. They come to us for our expertise. I like that last sentence. They come to us for our expertise, not to throw darts. Well, and there's a double-edged sword here uh, with the with the fun money account. And we've talked about this on the show quite a bit about having the sandbox account, right? The hey, this is my fun stock account, whatever. We put some parameters on this, you know, when clients ask us about it. Um, uh, mainly that if you if you hit it out of the park, so you do well. Uh, number one, you can't say, "See, I told you so," because you know you were trying to play a lottery game and you happened to win. And, and secondly, we reserve the right as your advisors to go, well, you should probably take some of those chips off the table. And secondly, if you don't win big, which you probably won't statistically, then you can't go back to the safe money that's for your long-term goals and ask for a refill. You know, if it's like, well, I want to do, I want to have a fun money account with 10 grand in it. And now you blow it up and it goes down to, you know, 2,200 bucks and you go, I need a refill. Nah, we're, 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 we're done with that experiment. You know, that's kind of the, the, the message that, that that we try to try to communicate. The other thing that's really interesting is when you really kind of peel back the layers of this, when it comes to individual stock positions or the speculative stock positions or whatever you want, even if it's sectors or whatever, it's like, really, what are you trying to gain? And what's the most upside? 
right? I've not known very many people who are like so committed to an idea that they're willing to take all of their capital into one singular idea, right? Most people are not that foolish. And so, so they're, you know, they're talking about a certain percentage, right? Like I want to take 10% of my portfolio and I want to go crazy with it. I want to buy all, you know, tech stocks or, you know, or I want to buy a single position. It's like, okay, cool. You got a million bucks. You want to put a hundred grand in this thing. What's the most that you hope happens? It's like, well, I hope it, I hope it goes up, you know, better than the market. It's like, all right, cool. So the market's going to do 10 automatically on average. What are you hoping you do 12? You hoping you do 13, 15? Like what's your number? And you start putting some dollars to that and you go, I'm taking all this risk for an extra 2,200 bucks return or an extra $5,000 return. You know, when you start putting real, real dollars and cents to these percentages that you're thinking about, it's really not moving the needle that much in the long run compared to the risk that you're taking of, you know, a single idea with a, with a, uh, with a percentage of your portfolio. Yeah. Riding that roller coaster. Um, for what? For a, the, for a few extra bucks. The emotional turmoil that you're going to go through. There might be some people listen to this OG with all of the talk still of, you know, of, of recession, of possible problems in the real estate market, all these things. This idea that we're in a bull market, there may be some stackers out there going, we're, we're in a what? We're in a bull, bull? Like, if you haven't looked at it lately, since last October, the S&P 500 has been going crazy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it seems it seems like uh, it was just a flash in the pan. But remember that, you know, at, at, at this time last year, we were kind of in the thick of it. We were just as far into it last year at this time as we are this year into this time and see how the differences feel. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, it's like, woohoo, everything's great. It's like last year was like, oh, I'm going to jump off a bridge. The sky's you falling. And, and, it's, and it's like, this is the same, you know, we've had the same experience, you know, over that same period of time. It's just the other side of the equation. Um, both of which, by the way, are unnatural, right? The minus 20 worse than average the plus 20 so far this year better than average you know so so what does that tell you when you look at like the concept of standard deviation or the concept of variability we're outside the norms on both sides of this right now so it seems like it's got to eventually settle back down well, and and that also brings up uh i think a good point if you sold at the bottom because of the fact that you were uh afraid you're like i can't take any more the the market roughly uh, bottomed out, I think, around October 11th. Uh, if you bought SPY, which is uh, the spider, that's the S&P 500, you, paid, uh, you got paid $357.74 a share, today trading at uh, $456 a yeah. share. So, some 20-odd some percent. Yeah, up, 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 well, up, up 100 bucks a share. Yeah, so... Big, big, big number. We will uh, link to this story and more resources in our show notes, and we'll dive deeper in the 201, our newsletter, stackybenjamins.com slash 201. And of course, we've been talking about this just the last couple of weeks. This week, uh, Kate, for her birthday, which was last Saturday, big milestone birthday, uh, said, hey, uh, let's do a giveaway. People that join the 201, you not only get these tips that you need, you will also uh, be in the running for some awesome Sennhauser noise canceling headphones if you're not familiar with sennhauser same brand that npr uses for their microphones this little known group called npr i don't know if people know who they are it's it's maybe we can help npr get a little bit more um get a little bit more coverage by giving these away but stackybenjamins.com slash 201 or slash birthday bash will get you there by the way if you already get the 201 good news for you as well uh if you just use your referral code that you'll find inside of every 201 your unique referral code Everybody you refer will get uh, will get a entry, and of course, so will you for every person that you refer. So people already getting the 201 can get multiple entries uh, where you can only get one for getting yourself in. Coming up next, OG and I have another top five uh, type of episode that as I go around the country and meet stackers, people are like, I love it when you guys do top fives, and we don't do enough. Well, we're doing one today. We're going to talk about red flags that might give you kind of a heads up that your advisor might not be as good as they could be. But before that, Doug, as we said earlier, I think you've got some yummy trivia. And I, and by the way, the reason you've got yummy trivia is because next week, OG this is a prelude. This is kind of like a signpost along the way. Next week, 
Len Penzo sandwich study Ooh, coming up. We're going to have Len Penzo diving into sandwiches, and you got it. I can't wait to see that egg salad sandwich. How much is the price of eggs gone they've up gone in a down. year? I say they've eggs gone down. Diving this year, into right? egg salad. Mm. Well, they've gone down now, but are they down? How far down are they off the high? Will we've been better to not have? I don't know. We'll, we'll see next week. But as a prelude, I think we got some Italian foods, Doug. It's Italian, Joe. I t- sorry, Italian. Italian. To go with my bruschetta. I swear to God, that's the right way to say that. Okay. Hey there, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I come bearing good news. In only seven days, Len Penza will be here to share the results from his sandwich survey. If you're new to stacking Benjamins, it's an annual tradition that you won't want to miss and a great way to see how inflation affects your wallet. Well, here to help lay out the red carpet, let's talk about one of his favorite topics, Bologna. See, that's how you say that word, too. Oh Funny thing, not only is Bologna a meat, it's also a great city in Italy. Yeah, while bologna is known for salty goodness between two pieces of bread with maybe some mayo, the city is famous for miles of historic porticos, its leaning medieval towers, and its gorgeous Piazza Maggiore. See, God, I'm nailing this. What do the two have in common? Both the city and the meat are part of a huge culinary tradition, you know, depending on who you ask. Bologna, the city, not the meat, has made tons of Benjamins. Well, it was Florins. Now I suppose it's Euros on its Bolognese meat sauce, but it's also known for bringing the world another popular Italian dish. So today's question, what dish is it? I'll be back right after I go set the table for dinner. I don't care what time it is, I'm starving after reading that. Hey there, stackers. I'm Alpha Man and meat lover Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. You know, bologna, this time, I mean the meat, not the city, has a great history of its own. Bologna is really bologna sausage derived from the Italian mortadella, which comes from the city bologna. See the connection? No? Well, get your glasses because it won't get better. Maybe we should just get you a trivia answer, huh? The question is, the city of bologna... Wait, Joe, is it Bologna? I think it's Bologna, isn't it? I was nailing all these Italian <laughs> pronunciations, and I've been screwing that one up the whole time. All right, keep moving. Just keep yeah, it moving. Okay, Maybe okay. nobody the will notice. Is, the city of Bologna is home to a time-honored Italian dish that, to this day, delights millions. What's the dish? Lasagna. Want more food stuff? You gotta wait one week. For now, let's feed your brains with some great info. Our top five red flags that tell you an advisor might not meet your needs with Joe and OG. Doug, even I'm hungry after the Oh my God, drink. all the good so food, confused the about foods. what's happening. Lasagna is like, so good. Italy or not. <laughs> it's, uh, in a week, Lempenzo we, taking us taking a, a team mis- trip. The Italian guy taking us into uh, sandwich land. Hey, uh, let's dive into this, OG, because, you know, we get questions about advisors and sometimes people will give us clues about their advisor. In fact, I had somebody uh, just email me today and they were telling me a little bit about their situation and just a couple things they said made me go. Boop. But the funny thing is for you and I, that's just years of experience. And so yeah. hopefully we can help people avoid the bad advisors, because, as you know, Having smart people in your corner is a key to success, right? You can't do it alone. You, you, you have to have to surround yourself with smart people. Every person who's gone anywhere. I don't know any of those people that were the, you know, this myth of the loner who just Mm -hmm. did it themselves. Other than the actual Lone Ranger. (laughs) True. Fictional character, by the Uh, way. Well, no, he had Tonto. He He did. Tonto. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and and favorite songs of all time. And you guys were playing weird songs earlier. We're going to have to bust out an an oldie but a goodie for me that talks about uh, the Lone Ranger. Oh, I have a feeling it's inappropriate. But but for right now, OG, as you were thinking about this top five, what were some of the things that really went through your head uh, when you were thinking about advisors not maybe not serving uh, people's needs? Is there like an overarching theme? Yeah, there's humility and the kind of 
and or lack thereof if you're thinking about it from the opposite side and uh and the all about me i think that's probably kind of sort of kind of sort of the the overarching thing and there's some other you know major red flags that are kind of easy to to digest but sure but the spidey sense tingling ones kind of sort of uh theme around that and i'll give you an example about this i mean ultimately and maybe this is one of them just kind of you know anecdotally um i was talking to a younger advisor who uh who had called me for something and was asking about a, a problem like a like a case scenario right how do i solve this problem and i said gosh i really just i don't even know the answer to that i, I have some ideas of where to start but but it sounds like you need to get you know, a pro involved in this, this particular issue, some, you know, some special, special issue. And, and he was like, well, no, 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 you know, clients pay, pay me to know these answers and, and, and be able to answer this for them. And I can't, wow. you know, I can't send them to another person. And I said, well, you're not sending them to another person. It's you're providing them the resource, the specialization. I mean, you know, if you have, I have a, I have a personal physician, right? A doctor that does all my lab work and that sort of thing. And when I texted him, I said, man, I have real trouble with my shoulder lately. I, I don't know what's going on there. He, he texted me back and said, go see this guy. He didn't say, well, why don't you come in and I'll po poke around a little bit and see if I can't solve it. He's like, I'm not a shoulder guy. Go see my shoulder guy. And, and I still come back to my main doctor. You know what yeah. I mean? Well, and, and if the doctor is, is great, uh, the doctor has a team of people, when you talked about lab work, who actually are doing the lab work. And notice yeah. this stuff all day long and then give the results back to the doctor who also weighs in. But a great doctor surrounds themselves with great people, just like a great uh, investor will surround themselves with other great investors and yeah. great, great, great advisors. Well, on that note, OG, let's uh, why don't we dive in with our number five? Number five. Who's going to start this? Shindig? You, you, you should. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to start off and this is because it's it it is number 5 because this one is going to be qualified. You know, I worked with a big company. There were a bunch of good advisors with the big company that I was with, the Meriprise. I I thought they were a fine company. However, just generally OG, when I hear that an advisor is with a big company instead of independent, and this does not mean independents are all great or big companies are all bad. I do hear big company, and I know there were many times during my career when the big company I was with had some ulterior agendas that truly were about sustainability of the company as much as they were about sustainability of the client. It was my job as an advisor to really kind of fight against that. When I saw great advisors at this company, they all did the same thing. So uh, I just put generally big company makes me go, hmm. And by the way, if it's big insurance company i go mm, even a, harder a double um yeah double um yeah i mean ultimately you can kind of just look and see where the where the interests are aligned it's really funny because a lot of if if you look at any sort of issue with i mean frankly any profession but we're talking about the money profession right now if there's an issue it it, it can almost always be traced back to what are the incentives it can almost always be traced back to that in a large organization is there's a lot of great resources. I was talking to a colleague today at lunch, as a matter of fact, and we were talking about the differences. And, and he said, well, you know, I, he said, I know a lot of guys that are going to the big shops because of the lot, the ability to get line of credits. You know, they've got, you know, a 15, $20 million investment portfolio. They don't have to go get a loan at the bank since they're at Merrill, Merrill Bank of America, kind of, yeah. you know, they're, they're to the, together. They're the same company. They can put their $20 million brokerage account up as collateral and go get a $15 million loan tomorrow afternoon and buy that building and start that project. And, you know, so there is some benefits to that for sure, you know, in terms of that, you know, uh, that level of service. Um, but the thing that's interesting is that on the, at the big company level, what is it? It's an organization that has shareholders and a shareholder has CEO has the CEOs and board of directors and their, their, their responsibility at Merrill, at Bank of America, at Ameriprise, at Wells Fargo, is to the shareholders. And there's more shareholders than clients generally, so certainly more dollars involved. Like, you want to be, you, you, you got to be responsible for the people that you're responsible for, right? And the CEO, the board of directors, they're responsible to shareholders. 
ultimately, you know, and that gets back to our credit union discussion that we had a week ago, right? Where credit unions, nonprofit organizations still want to make sure that they bring in more business all the time to keep the credit union going, but they're responsible to their members versus the shareholders. It is the same thing for an independent advisory firm though, too, right? The independent advisory firm doesn't have shareholders, but still wants to earn a, earn a profit. Absolutely. So while I think that's important, for the ownership. Yeah. I do think that I've seen the difficulty in this business with advice. This is why I think independent looking independent might be just a clear way to go is that I know how hard it is for an advisor to go independent. I know how difficult it is to run the business without that backbone of support. Like I had at Ameriprise when I had a franchise of that system to be able to make the jump first, which is not easy. And then second, to be able to set up all the systems on your own and to keep the systems and to make it all run really takes a level of commitment and expertise and commitment to the craft that you frankly may have. And and, and a lot of people do have. I don't want to I don't want to throw yeah, too no, much absolutely. shade here. There are some awesome people at some big companies um, who I really think do a hell of a job. But I mean, um, most of them, to be clear, like yes, the vast majority. Yeah, yeah. This is the thing that's interesting. It's like. You see, you see something, you know, on the news, right? And it's like the uh, picking something. I don't know the manicurist who murders people or something. I, you know, you go all manicurists are bad, right? No, they're not. No, the vast majority. You know, all doctors are generally pretty good. They try to help people. There is the one guy who gets hooked on pain pills and murders a bunch of patients, and you know, does a bunch of fraud. There is that guy. You in murdering patients. Yeah, well, I'm not a doctor, but I can ima- I can see how they do and it. Manicurists, murders yeah. are everywhere. I can, you know, <laughs> I'm just thinking about a story that I read about the other day. My point is, is that the vast majority of people are good. And yeah. The same thing is true with advisors. The vast but majority. That, of them are good. that still is my number five. I have a bias toward independent. It's not a deal killer. Definitely, though, OG, if I hear that it's going to be a financial plan and it's with an advisor that's with an insurance company, you better believe insurance coverage through that company is going to factor fairly heavily into your financial plan. Mm-hmm. What's your number five? Well, I'm going to stick with the the initial theme, which is the kind of know it all. It's all about me. You know, I wrote, I wrote it three different ways. Know it all. It's all about me. It's all, it's only them. <laughs> those, those are like the things that I wrote, you know, and, and to, to, as it relates to what you were talking about in terms of being independent versus a franchise or, or employee in a, an employee organization, um, it is a lot different to, to be in the business, running a business of providing advice versus, versus being the advice provider. Right. And to kind of to your point about commitment to the overall craft of providing advice to be able to organize a group of people and say, you know, we have this team of people, we have this group of people who all have different specialties who, who all, all are really good in their own right in different areas. And together that group of people are going to provide, you know, this level of service to the end user, to the client is a different level of, of commitment to the profession than, you know, being behind a desk and waiting for somebody to show up and going, what do you think I should do with my rollover? And you go, Oh, uh, well, we got these funds you should buy. You could do that. That's an idea. Or, you know, and I'm kind of, you know, giving, not giving enough credit, but you, you, it's kind of along those ways. If you're, if you're kind of on, if, if the person you're talking to is like, Oh no, no, I've got this big support group and it's the big sign out front. I go, eh, really? Kind of like what you were saying, really? You know, and there's some truth to that. Sure. But it's a lot higher commitment level. Um, if, if you can recognize and have the humility to understand that, that there are areas that you don't have expertise in and I'm willing to to find the solution or the advisor is willing to find the solution whether that's internally or externally to provide the best service i i feel like and this is my problem when i went over from the advisory side to the the financial media side was that there's too much emphasis on the word advisor the in, in sales and in sales people i mean yeah. an advisor in general no matter what they're advising you on og they advise you and advise you often does not mean they do it themselves. That is a product provider uh, uh, does it themselves. An advisor says, hey, OG, go over here and do this. 
go check out my guy over here. I'm going to hook you up with this great woman. She does this awesome work on taxes or mortgages or whatever it might be. You know, I got this professional doing X, Y, Z thing. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to uh, help you get connected with this group of people or this thing like an advisor advises, they do not keep it all in house. And certainly anybody who thinks, you know, and, and I am kind of biased against one stop shops for that reason. I think if you're doing 85 different things, if you're prepping, if you are providing the entire insurance solution, you're providing the tax advice, you're writing the will, you're doing the financial plan, you're doing, you know, you're doing everything with the financial plan. Heck, I'll write your car loan. I'll do all this stuff. How are you doing any of it really well? And are you truly the best in all these different areas if it's all in house? I doubt it. I just, I well, seriously doubt that it. you're talking about that because, because what you're talking about is a concept called wallet share, which is a really important concept in the big organizations, right? And they talk about it in their annual reports, you know, Merrill Lynch or, or I'm sorry, Bank of America or, or Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, these big organizations, they talk about how much of our, how much of our clients wallet share do we have? Because to be fair, the more, the more things you have with one organization, the less likely it is for you to leave that organization, right? Sure. I mean, if your mortgage and your 401k and your checking account, savings account, credit cards are all with Bank of America, it's like, I, I don't, you know, how much of a pain in the ass is it to move half that stuff to Vanguard and go find a credit union and get better interest on your savings account and that sort of thing? I also think to your point, you know, when I got better as an advisor at the end of my career, it was... I was trying to model our practice like uh, like I was a sports agent. Like it wasn't about me. It was about my client who was a phenomenal sports star or Taylor Swift. I mean, you know, create the analogy. Taylor Swift was my, your client? My client is the rock star. My client is the star. And it's not about me, OG. It's about them. And how do I make sure I'm the concierge for them to get more money in their pocket, to do more for the, to, to make sure that they get uh, as much as they possibly can with the things that they have, how can we wring as much out of, out of their company benefits, out of their, um, out of their, their, their paycheck into their savings account, out of their investing strategy, whatever it might be that we do the right thing. So when you said, you know, it's about me, 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 I think it needs to be about you, 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 meaning you, you, you client. But just to be clear, did you still have Taylor Swift as a client when she released 1989? Because that album is amazing. I, I, I just, all I can think about is that workday commercial where they're like, you need to, all the rock people are like, you need to quit calling each other rock stars. <laughs> That's right. It's like Ozzy Osbourne and, <laughs> and uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Good job stapling that, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> you're a rock star. Gene Simmons like sticks his head in. They're like, Bill, you're a, and he like sticks his head in. He's like, uh, you did really good. <laughs> and he like shuts the door. <laughs> it's like, you got to quit using, you're not, unless you are actually a rock star, you are not a rock star. Number four. Okay, number four for me. I'm going to go with um, there's there's not any proactive communication. You don't know what the schedule <laughs> looks like in the in the future. It's so some ambiguous so just, just time before, horizon. Just before you go into yours, my number four. There is no scheduled meeting cadence. Ah, same stuff. Yeah, same stuff. Yeah, same same deal. So I I, I really feel like you know you should be able to look out in the horizon and see the tempo of when you're expected to have some sort of some sort of communication whether that's you know monthly quarterly annually semi-annually like what's the what's the you know what's the frequency of when i can count on you to be proactive with me so you being the advisor to be proactive with me in terms of um you know when when you know when do i have to when do I have to think about this? And when are you thinking about it? Yeah, I absolutely love that because I think that no matter what the cadence is, knowing that they have an approach and that that approach has worked for a lot of people already means it has a better chance of working for me. If we never talk about that and it was more of a sales relationship where I buy something and then I never hear from them again, well, then we have a problem. It also gives me the parameters around how to judge them, right? If you say you're going to contact me twice a year, let's say, and you don't, then I have good reason to say, hey, I'm not getting the service that I was promised. Mm -hmm. But if you don't know what that expectation is, it's very difficult. By the way, the other thing that I like, I also like that between those meetings, then I also feel comfortable calling my advisor and asking their opinion if something comes up. 
I'm buying a new car and I'm wondering if I should finance it because I can get a 0% loan versus just pay cash that's in my car fund account. Or if I'm, you know, changing houses or changing jobs that whether those are included and then I'm going to get advice from you on those things, or if I'm not getting advice or those are going to cost extra, I really want to be clear about what that meeting cadence is and how it's going to work. Great minds think alike. You just move to number three. Number three. Well, since technically I went last, but I feel like we kind of held hands and jumped that one together. Uh, number three is is this. You know, oh, gee, remember back in the day when we were very active blogging? We had one piece. And you were active blogging, <laughs> and I was actively talking about your blogging. Good, yes. good, good point. But if I you remember, remember if you remember the blog, there was one piece that went, uh, that, that got close to, you know, if we're going to call anything viral at all that we did, this one went viral, and it was, how to know that your advisor sucks before you even meet with the advisor. And it was, it was the office setting, what's going on in the office and the employee. So my number three was you can really often when you're interacting with the advisor's employees, you can get a real feel for how the, how the organization works. Because as an example, when I was with Ameriprise, they had a receptionist named Linda, who was absolutely horrible at the start, it was just absolutely rotten. And that stuff often comes from the top. And the guy that ran the office, Tony, good guy, but didn't pay much attention. And then he realized that needed to change. He and Linda made it, made it better almost overnight. The two of them, they took a Nordstrom training. They did some great work together. And then, man, I realized that Every office I walked into, and because I was a, a speaker going around uh, all of Eastern Michigan, so I went into a lot of different offices, you could tell what the manager of that office was doing and what the different advisors were doing based on that receptionist mm -hmm. and, 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 and how good they were. And really, Linda was kind of a testament to, you know, a pretty good thing Tony was doing in Southfield. Okay. Good job, Tony and Linda. Yeah. But as an example... If they, if you go into their office and they're playing Kramer yelling or, you know, uh, uh, power lunch where they're talking about all the hot stocks that day, yeah, I would turn around and run. If they've got the travel channel on, maybe the golf channel, you know, they've got, they've got, you know, pretty pictures on their stuff that relaxes you. That's what a good financial plan should do. It shouldn't be about, about, um, Stacky <laughs> Benjamin's episode yeah. playing in the background. You know, <laughs> any of those things would be great. That's what a probably about a accessories poster. Would that be a good sign? <laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> Soar. If they, I mean, there were other things, you know, if the advisor sits behind a huge desk, whenever right. I had an advisor that sat behind the huge desk, Sorry, oh, gee, not. you know, this guy, I'm, I'm just going to say the first name. There was a guy we work with back in our American Express, Dave, named Glenn. And Glenn would always sit behind this desk with a high back chair and his, his clients were in folding chairs. And I thought he was a horrible advisor. And, and I was like, Glenn, why do you do? Well, I want to make sure my clients know who's in charge. And I'm like, that's why I would never, ever recommend you to anybody, man. So a complete side note, when, when Ameriprise closed their Toledo office, I stole, <clears throat> took a bunch of stuff off the wall. And one of them, and a couple of them were these things. Or accessories poster. What does that one say? Virtue. I is, of it, is it backwards? Attitude. No, virtue of attitude. Oh, and it just goes through the virtue of having a good attitude. But what's something funny is... Something about a purple imagery with some dude, I don't know, fishing or something. Uh, just so everybody's clear, you say the word steal, OG, but you and I knew what happened when offices closed. Those things just went in a dumpster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were gone. So, so you were like, you rescued that like it was a dog. <laughs> he did. Something. did rescue it. <laughs> yes, it's his rescue successory. <laughs> There's another one upstairs that I've got. It was going to starve to death if I didn't take it out of the dumpster. It's like a, it's like a sailboat, like canted sideways, like tacking into the wind. Uh, yeah. I have no idea what it says, but it's it's a sailboat, so it's obviously motivational. So I think you can look at the surround sound the advisor is providing. What does the surround sound look like? And man, if it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't feel on, if they have bad employees, I would say all that stuff comes from the top. It all comes from the top. That's my number three. Okay, so uh, I, I got to put something in there about cost because because you know everybody's like you know, itchy itchy trigger fingers like what about the cost structure? fees what fees, about fees fees and and we've said a hundred thousand times I don't actually care 
how advisors get paid. And there's about 350 different ways to do it. And all of them are fine, in my opinion, for the right people. And can we also add something else there, OG, just yeah. while you're on that statement? Also, I believe the attention to fees is because most people don't know enough about really what's going on in the financial planning business to truly comment on anything else. It's easy, it's low hanging fruit, and it's lazy. Just want to add that. Well, in I'm looking at it from the from the client perspective, maybe in the media perspective, it's it's lazy for sure. But on the client perspective, it's something that's right there. And, and again, back to my what I was saying before, I don't know that there's a right answer for it. I think that the people that you're working with should be able to easily articulate what they get paid for and how much it costs. And that simple. And unabashedly, like, we get X dollars, we charge you this much per month, we have this percentage fee, we have this structure, A, B, C, da, 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 da. If you get into some sort of like, well, you know, we really get paid a couple of different ways and it just depends on the products and sometimes and, and we're really paid a third way and that's through your recommendations and your referrals and like, okay, just tell it to me straight, man. How much is it per month? How much is it per year? How much is it per, on a percentage base? Like whatever your deal is, just hit me with it. Right? Lay it out. It is what it is. And there's nothing wrong with it, especially if you're a business owner associated with running a business of financial planning or advice of some kind, CPA firm, whatever it is, you need to, as a, as a, the owner of that business, be able to pay your employees and heat and cool your building and you know, all that sort of stuff. So, so you've put some thought, you've put some thought into it. Hopefully you're not just arbitrarily going, I don't know, I charge us. How's 600, how does that sound? How's 650 sound for your tax forms today, sir? Like, you've sat down and said, this is how long it's going to take me. And this is how I'm going to charge based on that and the time and expertise and that sort of thing. So just do it the same way. Like it's don't be like the doctors. Don't be like the hospital where my son broke his arm and nobody like, knows. They're like, how much oh, are you paying insurance or cash? And I'm like, well, how much is it? We don't know. Well, you fixed an arm. I'm certain in the past, it's a big building. You have lots of doctors here. You must have a general sense of how much it costs to fix a broken arm. No, we don't know until we bill your insurance company. And I just couldn't even believe it. I, I, it I just, it, you know, and that's, I well, think sometimes advisors do that. They're like, well, how much you got? Like, yeah. well, <laughs> no, what do you mean? How much I got? How yeah, much what? is it? Well, how much you, what kind of car you want? You know, it's like, well, and that's tell, what's difficult too. With. Like if I'm trying to evaluate whether to hire somebody to be in my corner or not, I got to know what the value is. I mean, one of the, one of the questions, OG, that frustrates me the most is, is that expensive, right? How often have we had that question? Yeah. Uh, I get charged X amount. Is that expensive? My first question always is, well, what are you getting for that? Right. I need to know what you're, cause it might be super expensive. You might be paying next to nothing and it could be hugely expensive. You'd be paying a ton of money and it's not expensive at all because you're getting this Cadillac of service. So what am I getting versus what I pay? I think is uh, is a much better metric. And and by the way, this is you know we've we've uh, interviewed people at uh, at different philanthropies, and this is kind of a carryover. There was a period when it come to philanthropic giving, and there's still people with philanthropic giving that are like, "What's your overhead?" And what's the kickback we've seen on that lately? OG, the the best evaluations of a philanthropy are not around overhead, they're around reach and results because, and we've had people on this show tell us this, we need to be able to hire good people to get good results. I can't pay people nothing and and get great talent in here to get great results. So if I pay a little more, we can extend the reach by X times that. You know, we could 10X, we could 100X that because we actually paid a little more. So it's not always about expenses. It's about what do I get for that? So I like that one, two punch as well. Number two. Okay. I guess it's my turn. Number two. Um, this one's kind of an easy one, an unexplainable or unanswerable, unreasonably answered disclosure on ADV, SEC website, broker check, something like that. Right. Oh, like, that's a good one. There's, there's, I there's miss a this. public, there's a public uh, location where you can do your checking on your people. And, and so um, if you're a broker or an advisor, there's a website called Broker Check. You can just put that into Google. You can look at the SEC website and look for search for my advisor on the SEC website. If they're a CFP certificate holder, you can search for disclosure history on the CFP board as well at cfp.net. 
Um, and all of us have things in our past that we wish we would have done differently. Right. I mean, I can, I was just talking to a buddy of mine at lunch about estate planning and he's like, I'm just giving all the money to my kids at 25. And we talked about that. And I said, you know, I'd like to think I was pretty responsible at 25, but in the hindsight of looking at four from 45 to 25, I was an idiot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And, and, you know, and I could say that about being 44, honestly, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, that 44 year old OG, he was, he was dummy. But, um, but some of those, some of those foibles, some of those errors, some of those uh, errors in judgment, mistakes, whatever, turn up on, uh, your record for, if you're going to be an advisor, right? Especially if it's money related. And there's, there was a long time, a very long time, I think almost until 2012 ish or so where any sort of financial, issues in the back in the background almost excluded you completely from being in the financial industry. If you had a bankruptcy, if you had a foreclosure, if you had a tax lien, if you had anything, you know, missed a payment on your credit card, and done. red flag, you were done. done. From the recession in 2007 to 2009, the government and also the CFP board sort of relaxed those standards a little bit and said, we understand that life happens on occasion, right? It's just, you do your best and things don't go according to plan. And as long as you can kind of sort of explain what happened and how you solve the problem, we will be willing to, you know, talk about that or allow you to stay in. And so I'm not talking about financial issues where it's like, listen, I had a medical thing. My, my partner got sick. We had a medical issue. Mom and dad were ill. I had to sell the house in foreclosure, da, 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 red flag, right? That's what happened. I'm talking about the red flags of client complaint settled out of court, client complaint, settled out of court, client complaint, settled. Like what's going on here? You know, if you've got ding, 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 all these, you know, oh, the client screwed me. Oh, my boss screwed me. Uh, you know, I got screwed on that. And there's not really any answers to that. Anything that has to do with fraud or, 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 you know, malfeasance with client funds, automatic, never pass go, do not collect $200, right? There's no, there's no coming back from that in my book. Personal financial issues, I think you can have some conversation around it, you know, try to understand what happened in their circumstances because it's going to be there. Um, but um, uh, but if, there's, if it's not explainable easily, mm, my spidey sense is tingling a little bit. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and if they just shy away from the discussion, you know, I've uh, said publicly that on my record, there was there was one complaint and I was very happy to go through it and talk about exactly what happened. And it frustrated the hell out of me that it was on yep. there. And I think through my explanation of and this is the bad news, OG, it was on there for a good last four years of my of my tenure as an advisor. And I think two people, two people looked at my record between my yeah. existing clients and people that were thinking about who to hire. Not enough people do exactly what you just said when they hire help. Go well, now see what's out there. Yeah. It, and it, it's, it's really interesting. We have, uh, we're, we're, we're fortunate that we have a company that comes, that comes every couple of weeks to do a, a little clean in our house. And, and we were thinking, I was thinking about like, think about all the stuff that you do when somebody's going to come roof your house or clean your house or mow the grass or, you know, do something. You go, well, do you have insurance? Are you licensed? You know, I'm going to check the builders association, make sure you're in good standing. I do all these things. And then what do you do when you go to hire a, uh, an investment advisor? Oh, well, she seemed nice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I just, I, I was really easy. I just rolled over my $2 million account. It was super simple. Like, yes, I'm great. Did you give them a once over? Did you look online? Or did you Google them real fast? You know, just well, to, you think about the fact of where you're getting your advice. It always frustrates me because that's often what happens when people are getting advice from the wrong places. They didn't do enough due diligence up front. And I feel like if you're going to surround yourself with a great board of advisors, you're going to do a lot of, if, if these people are going to base your life decisions on in areas where you might have blind spots do half an hour of due diligence. Well, it's like that CFP commercial, right? Where the, where the guy's, the guy's a DJ, the guy's a DJ. He's like, he goes, all right, so this is your plan. And what did you think about it? And they're like, oh, it's great. It's great. Because he's like, do you, do, you, do you think I'm pretty trustworthy? Do you think you'd take it? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's like, well, that's great because I'm a DJ. And he takes his hat <laughs> off. He's got long hair. And he's like, you know, he's like, I'm not really an advisor at all. He's, I know that's, nothing. That's I learned why you the script. Have to search, search this that up. That was a great campaign. They should have kept running that. Yeah, they should have. 
It could have I mean, done so many different professions there, and it would have been hilarious. To your point, Doug, it was a long time ago. We're still talking about it, yeah. right? And everybody, there's a bunch of people out there who are listening who know exactly the campaign we're talking about. If you don't, uh, Kevin will list it in our, our 201 and also in the show notes. Uh, so you can take a look. I, for every yourself. time you say that, Joe, I just picture Kevin in the background, like, Don't, "Holy God, God, how man. am I going to find that? What, is that? what are you talking, talking about? about? <laughs> yeah, just some vague old it's ad the campaign. Slack, he's he's slack volunteer channel. me again. I'm he on. Volunteer oh, me Joe, again. Regarding the uh, the yeah, he's on Slack. He's like, dear Joe, please <laughs> advise what the hell you're talking about at the 51 minute mark. No idea. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, my number two is if an advisor uses lots of jargon An advisor's job is to make things easier. And I found that in my time spent with advisors, the biggest BS artists were the ones that like to talk in big words and truly weren't good advisors. But the alpha and beta and standard deviation omega. Uh, Alpha and, beta. And by the way, it doesn't mean you should shy away from that stuff because I would definitely show people the beta as an example, but it was my job then to explain what it was to say, Doug's Hey, let's got a restraining order for showing people his beta. <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna, too often. It's, and it's an industry me. specific term, apparently, you know, based, based on his history, he's not allowed to show anybody his beta. <laughs> it's like Jeff at the uh, wedding reception that we talked about last That's week right. with the, with the the kilt <laughs> going around showing 18 beef his sister-in-law 18 times his beta yeah not yes. good but do uh but i think that advisors that use lots of jargon listen their job is to make your life easier their job is to simplify it make sure you understand it's not their plan it's your plan and your main goal is if your advisor gets hit by a bus you want to be better off by having work with them and if you don't understand what the hell you're doing well then then it's it's not a great so that's my number two uh get away from get away from lots of Lots of lots of jargon or people, Doug, that do the smoke and mirrors kind of thing, I think, which sometimes it's easy to see and sometimes it's not. I know you've got an example of one that I think we've talked about in the past. Well, is it the one where you guys have both groaned when I've talked about that really big firm that's got commercials on TV all the time that says we make we do better when our clients do better? Right. Is it that one? And that one is tough. I mean, this one. This one is a little different because because the average person listening won't get this. But there's a huge number of advisors out there that do the same thing. And this guy is named Ken Fisher. And whenever I see Ken Fisher's advertisements, he takes something that everybody else does. See, we do this thing where we look at the most efficient use of your asset. Really called the efficient frontier? Jerk? Something everybody else does? Oh, no, it's proprietary. You got to go through. Got to go through my genius to get it. Just, I don't know if Ken Fisher is a good or bad advisor, but there's no way. He's a big advisor. I would I say he's you. nobody. Yes. Is he anybody's advisor anymore? No, based, I don't think so. Based on his advertisements, he's uh, just, it always makes me roll my eyes. Just the advertising that guy does is crazy. All right, that's my number two. What's yours, OG? Or Jerry? Did my, you did, yeah. I'm sorry. You're we're up. on to the big one. It's time for the big one. And we're not, talking about, Doug's, we're not talking about Doug's beta. <laughs> number one. I'm just sitting here in the corner, minding my own business. Next thing I know, my bait is all over the room. Uh, yeah, my number, my number one is uh, borrowed. Uh, I, I've always agreed with this emotion. Our mutual friend Roger Whitney put it in a way that I had not heard it, but I absolutely love this to the point that it is my number one. Oh, gee, if somebody presents himself as an advisor, not a product salesperson. And they lead the discussion around product and not process. You need to run. That is my number one, that they're probably not great advisor in your corner. As your number one. Dude. It's good, isn't it? It's great. I literally wrote leads with product, not goals. Yeah. It yep. shortens the show a little bit, which everybody yeah. will appreciate. Yeah. yeah, this is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I really think that our job as advisors is to help people think about how to think about things. And that's borrowing a phrase from strategic coach. Think about your thinking. And, and, you know, sometimes people are asking questions like, do you think that this is a good budget item on our cash flow? You know, are we within bounds here? Is a thousand bucks a month good for groceries? And our job, I don't think, is to necessarily say it is or it isn't, right? Should I have the Sunday ticket package for DirecTV? I don't know, man. How much do you like football? Like, 
Like it's, if you like it a lot, then it's probably a good use. I mean, if you're going to watch it all Sunday, like it's probably a really good use of money, honestly, versus pay-per-viewing or going to the Cowboys game every Sunday. It's going to cost you way more, way more to do that. But, but it's not necessarily to say these are the right or wrong things. It's to say what's important to you and how do we use the resources that you have to do the things that you want to do? And, and I mean, you said this earlier, the more that your advisor is focused on what do you want to do and how can I help you do you, the better off the relationship's going to be. And if you, and if you show up and, and you were picking on insurance firms earlier, Joe, but it's, you know, it's kind of sort of true because we've seen these plans from people. And if you show up and, and you're like, okay, I think I want to retire. And they're like, cool, let me show you this great life insurance product I have. There they're it like, is. What, wait, what? I thought I said I wanted to retire. Yeah, 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 retire, retire. That's great. Great retirement is awesome. But life insurance, you know, and you're focused on that or or you have a proprietary product of some kind, you know, a mutual fund or you have a separately managed account or you have some some deal that's that's tied to your firm specifically and you're leading with the product instead of the solution or instead of the goal rather that the client's trying to reach or, you know, reach toward most advisors these days should have access to just about every product. Yeah. And, and if you don't, that's an issue. If you do have access to every product and yet you're still leading with product, it tells me that it's about the money and not about goal attainment, you know? So goal attainment's number one thing. Very clear path. Very, very clear path and a huge, not even a red flag. That is, that's a run. That's a go. Got to go. Doesn't mean by the way, you don't buy products from them. Oh, gee, they might have a great product. They're just not your advisor. Well, I mean, yes and no. I mean, I, I can, I see what you're saying, but I want to be clear about it. We, you know, like in our firm, we use Schwab as a custodian, independent third party, you know, to hold your money. We recommend mutual funds and ETFs to use for clients. Um, does that mean that you should buy them at Fidelity instead? I don't know. But if you start with it, I think is really the delineation. You yeah, know that's I mean? my, no, that's my point. That is, that is clearly, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is de- agreed. I mean, in the initial conversation, this is how you tell, I mean, you can tell this right away. If, if in the first 30 minutes of a conversation with somebody new, if the conversation is about, tell me all the money you have, Tell me where it is, and I'm going to tell you everything that's wrong with what you're doing right now. Instead of, tell me where your money is, and tell me what you're trying to do. Tell me about your goals. What what's what's the purpose of all of this stuff? How can you how can you know? Back to I said I had a doctor analogy earlier, right? You don't walk into the doctor and he doesn't he doesn't or she doesn't just say, okay, yeah, 45 year old, huh? Okay, cool. So um, uh, we're gonna take some vitamin D pills and uh, let's get you on Crestor. And, uh, and let's order up a colonoscopy. Let's go get, let's go get that done right now. You go, well, what are you talking about? Those, that's all medicine. Don't you have to do some tests first? Don't you have to, don't you have to see what's going on inside before you start writing out prescriptions? You need to, you know, you need to work from a goal standpoint. And what are you trying to accomplish before you start implementing things? We will have these listed on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. And of course, in the 201, uh, Kevin will have deeper dives. He's not growing about that one. That's what one that he, that's something he always does in the 201 newsletter. Looking at the time, I think uh, that is going to wrap for this episode because we, uh, and again, there it is. <laughs> the the uh, uh, I think that that will make this a super long show if we go there. So we'll have the Haven Life next time. Uh, however, let's talk about the community calendar. Uh, the 201 uh, contest I mentioned for the headphones already. StackyBenjamins.com slash birthday bash or st- slash 201. And you can get multiple, multiple entries if you refer other people that need the 201 um, to get your referral code, make sure you're working from your 201 newsletter. And inside your 201 newsletter, you will see your direct referral code. Uh, we, on Thursdays, tomorrow, I will be on Instagram with a guest. Uh, head over to Instagram, 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. We will be chatting with them. Sometimes it's uh, also Doug with me. Sometimes it's just me and you. And we, it's a great time because we get to 
be a little bit more interactive. Well, a lot more interactive than we could be on the podcast. So if you want to stop by and say hi, take part in a great uh, money discussion, hit us up on Instagram. For all the places you can find us live, stackingbenjamins.com slash welcome. We're going to be doing a uh, live recording of the Friday show coming up as well on the Fireside app. Joe, you whenever are, I'm there on the Instagram. Yep. I am. Whenever you are. I th- <laughs> whenever I'm there on in, on the Instagram, the interaction largely consists of people just taking <laughs> shots at me. And it's just like they're at the zoo and they just Especially want to poke Drew. The bear. <laughs> they want to see if they can get a reaction. Does that happen when I'm not there? No, or do they do that they do to not. you? Stacker Drew oh, specifically take shots at you. Uh, I notice happens in the basement too. Yeah. You and Drew have this. Uh, it happens a little bit in this, the basement uh, love too. Affair, if you want to call it that. Uh, okay. And finally, if you're not here to be on Instagram lives, if you're not here to rip into Doug, if you're not even here because you want those awesome Sennhauser uh, noise canceling headphones, you're here because you need a better plan. And today's discussion about advisors and who to have on your team really resonates for you. Well, OG and his team are taking clients. And if you'd like to talk to him and his team about how they might be able to help you, stackingbenjamins.com slash OG. All right. That is it for today, Doug. And there's a lot to unpack there, but let's uh, keep it to three. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe first, take some advice from our top five. Advisors should have process that works for you and not be all about product. Second, thinking about buying risky investments? Yeah, your advisor probably won't be on board and with good reason. But the big lesson? Do not volunteer to wash the windows in exchange for Joe's mom's lasagna. She'll make you clean the inside and the outside. Now that's some real bologna. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2023, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. This show was written by Joe Salcihai with help from me, Doc G from the Earn and Invest Podcast, and Lacey Langford from the Military Money Show. Kevin Bailey helps us take a deeper dive into all the topics covered on each episode in our newsletter called The 201. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Tina Eichenberg makes the video version of this show. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude and Kate Youngkin are our social media coordinators, and Gertrude is the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. So say hello when you see us posting online. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. Not only should you not take advice from these nerds, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. I know on the TikTok minute on Monday, we did the uh, we did the cops that will come grab you in a public location in front of your spouse, take you away, tase you for an extra twenty five bucks, and then they set you up at a at a campsite, fish, beer, everything all taken care of, and then drop you off at the end of the weekend at Waffle House and say it was a big mistake, and generally operate in confusion so you get a nice weekend away, and that was stereotypically. You know, the guy stereotypically said men and a lot of the people in the comments were women going, hey, I want this, too. It's not just men. Well, this this uh, other thing I found in a Facebook reel, I think truly is men more than more than women. But I'd like you guys to weigh in on this. This is if uh, if married men had to have a remembering bee like kids have a spelling bee. Let's listen in. On Tuesday. Your wife informed you about dinner plans for this Saturday. Who are those plans with and what time? 
Can you say it in a sentence? Quote, <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling your ass now, but we are meeting blank <laughs> at blank for dinner. Okay, and can you can you say it, but with like a more annoyed tone? Quote, I don't know why I'm telling your ass now, but we are meeting blank at blank for dinner. End quote. Since Tuesday, how many times has she reminded me? Uh, that would be five times. <laughs> okay. Um, we are going to meet Ricky and Annette at six. <laughs> I do think in my relationship that is stereotypically correct maybe not for all i thought that's maybe not for all couples pretty good but i'm definitely the couple who gets reminded oh gee are you the couple in yours uh we have a very firm rule if it's not in the calendar it's not happening hmm. it, it'll be like it'll be like no no there's uh, uh I, th I, th I thought i put it in the calendar. it's like it's not in the calendar it's like well i i thought i put it in there it's yeah like, but well, is that a one way hold in, on though know, is that a one-way street where she puts it in the calendar or do you put stuff in the calendar? I'm not important <laughs> enough to actually have things to put in the calendar. So I assure you, there's nothing that's in the calendar. You're that not is the social director in your family. I have, I have, as, 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 which would come as a shock to you, but I'm not a fan of social anything. <laughs> people, well, that's just because people suck. Media. Uh, Doug? You know. Yeah, no, it's the other way around, and I'm the social director in our house, so I'm the one who's who's doing the reminding several yeah. several times. And I'm willing to bet there is not the inverse of that video. What do you mean? There is not one of those where it's the wife on stage trying to remember. Like you're what saying, the she, husband. You're saying her. she does sure remember. That video doesn't exist. No, I'm saying she doesn't. She, my no, mine it's the doesn't. Same thing. And, it's just. Yeah. And I'm saying there isn't oh, one no, there out is, on the internet no. making fun of that no. because it doesn't because no, no one can make fun no. of that. No, that is not. It's that not is allowed. totally not allowed. But man, that is that is my household specifically right there. Welcome to the After After Show. You know why? Because you are a rock star and you need a second, <laughs> you need a second encore of this show. And OG, oh, you have seen some television. I have seen things. So, yeah, just, just uh, got, got a quick second to catch up on some things. Uh, this is season two of a really, really great program. Taxi cab confessions. I am offering you a chance to atone for what you have done. To help bring down the single greatest threat to New Orleans. I can't do this. There are memories that I just can't bear. Who do you think you're talking to? Have I given you the impression that any of this is optional? Why do I keep seeing you around my hotel? What are you home with my family? You just keep doing everything I tell you to do. And you will be just fine. What are you not telling me? Stay away from my family. The Bax is hunting you down. That's not how this is going to play out. What is that? Was one of those voices know, John Goodman? I can't remember the name of it. Right, Brian, Brian Cranston. Cranston Brian that's Cranston. who that was. Yeah. It's yeah. the second season oh, of Your yeah, Honor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where I think it's been out a little kid while, messes with the judge. I watched the first, what is it, the mm. first three episodes that messes were... messes with the judge? That's not Wasn't what that happens in that show. 
If you don't know, don't even. I don't, thought that was the first episode. One. I will say, I watched that because the first three episodes I think were available for free, and I watched, and it was fantastic. I just it wasn't fantastic enough for me to sign up for that streaming service because I don't already have it, so I didn't sign it's up. Like Showtime. But, yep. Showtime, yeah, but I mean, if they ever like, maybe now that season two is out, if they re if they release the rest of season one, I'm all in because it was yeah, it's really all good. It's all. I no, it's it's uh, Brian Cranston's a judge. His son, very early in the first episode, is involved right. in a hit and run. And so his son, his son is you know there's some issues going on That's with right. his son. His son ran from the crime. You know there's some extenuating circumstances. Uh, so this is season two of it. Completely different uh, setup. Uh, I can't. If you haven't seen season one, it's almost past the point of being able to like claim I didn't see it yet. Don't tell me. You but know. I always do find but, it funny. Um, do they connect? Oh, do yeah. the seasons connect. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. It's a continuation. Yeah. All it's right. this is this is just the story. It just they just happen to hit pause kind of right there. Gotcha. Well, that's seasons. much better than some of these shows where the the same people are involved in a similar thing but different every every time. And you're like, how unlucky is this family? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't want to yeah. wake up. I don't want to wake Time up to in move. the house. No, I thought that this was probably, I mean, right up there in terms of the writing of, you know, not witty writing like Succession and Billions and that sort of thing, but but the drama and suspense uh, is right up there with, with any, uh, and, and the, any quality uh, writing. It's fantastic. And you liked it too, Doug. You liked the first one. I really did. No, I did like it. And now you got me thinking about it again. Like, well, maybe I'll subscribe to Showtime because it, no, it was solid. I, well, and Billions is coming out again here pretty quick too. So Yeah, uh, there's something else on Showtime that's that you've told me about that I didn't watch. You tried to I can get the early seasons of Billions now on uh, Amazon Prime. Yeah. I think that's right, Joe. So maybe that'll... Yeah. Bobby's coming back I for the final that. season of Billions. I saw oh, that he's back. Although it's probably it's probably like one of those stupid things where he shows up in the like that guy doing American accent um, is so natural to me after after Billions and Band of Brothers that when he at well Homeland that's right he was like a and major, Homeland too so so, so when Homeland. I hear him being interviewed it it messes with my he, head he's so good at it I, you know little known secret but he's actually faking his British accent <laughs> he's really American. <laughs> And he's just faking the British accent because yeah. he knows they sound more yes. charming and smarter. Yeah. It's so his PR people have told him. Pretend. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Yeah. And it's so easy to Duh, do a British accent. You do it all the time. Damien Lewis. We've had British callers on the show before. Is that who it is? Damien Lewis? Yeah. I think yeah. It is Damien. Not, yeah. Was he, uh, wasn't he in Lincoln too? No. Or, I don't remember him in Lincoln. Lincoln. The movie with Daniel Day Lewis? Daniel yeah. Day Lewis. No, that's guy. the other guy yeah. who's a good actor. Day Lewis, Day, Daniel Damon, uh, D's and L's, some, some, some guy, some, some guy doing something. 